Welcome everyone to Embracing Clemency, a national town hall on the power of redemption. My name is Dylan Hare and I serve as a Justice Division campaign strategist here at the ACLU. Tonight's town hall is part of a campaign kickoff that's been happening throughout the day. The ACLU is honored to be officially launching the redemption campaign, the pivotal next step in our campaign for smart justice. This is a nationwide effort to liberate 50,000 people from state prisons over the next five years by pushing governors to use their existing clemency powers in new and transformational ways to confront mass incarceration and racial injustice by granting categorical commutations to release people who are unjustifiably imprisoned. To learn more about why clemency is so crucial in the fight for decarceration, we're going to hear tonight from leading experts and activists in the field. We'll hear from clemency expert Rachel Barkow and our very own Cynthia Roseberry. We're honored to be joined as well by Centoya Brown and Jason Hernandez, inspirational leading voices in the fight for mass clemency. And a bit later, we'll chat with San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Boudin, whose own journey and vision have profoundly shaped the justice reform movement. But first, We'll play a trailer of a short documentary, which we will premiere in full at the end of tonight's town hall. So please sit back, relax, get ready to be inspired. And thank you so much for joining us tonight for Embracing Clemency. Our prison system right now is based on punishment. It should be based on redemption. There's not some magic number of years that if they sit in a prison cell will atone for the harm that they've caused to their victim or their victim's family. The judicial process doesn't always allow for compassion. It doesn't always allow for someone to see, okay, I see you as a person. I understand there's some more things we can do. Sometimes statute binds them. Uh, I think that we're real, really kind of in a crisis where we have got so many people locked up doing such long sentences that it's almost like releasing a pressure valve. And I think that all those sentences that are not uh, proportionate to the crime should be evaluated. You know, people can't just be thrown away and it's not wise to just, just throw people away. We're capable of growing and becoming better people. Amazing. Thank you so much to my colleague, Lewis Conway, who has been directing that video, uh, working on that video for months. Our first guest tonight is someone who has been a leader in this work, whose voice you just heard in that video, and whose own story has deeply inspired thousands of people across the country. We are honored to be joined by author and activist, Centoya brown -Monk. Welcome, Hello. Centoya. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So I know most people watching this, many people watching this know who you are, but for, the, for those who don't, why don't you please just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your path toward clemency, and maybe just tell us sort of what clemency is and why it's such a critical piece of the fight for justice reform. Absolutely. So my name is Centoya, and when I was 16 years old, I was charged with murder in the state of Tennessee. I killed a man who had picked me up for sex, and I was charged as an adult. In this state, that means that I was subject to the same punishments as any adult would receive. In the state of Tennessee, that means 51 years in prison before I would ever be considered for release. I went through the appellate process trying to get some sort of relief based on the fact that I was just a juvenile when it happened. The Supreme Court had made several findings that juveniles were not as culpable as adults. They had made findings about the brain structures of juveniles being different from adults, and that was the basis for really just taking their youth into consideration. But what I found after going through court after court was that the statute didn't allow for that consideration. And unless the legislature had changed that and made it retroactive, that couldn't be of any use to me. So after every appeal was denied, all that was left was clemency. And clemency is the executive authority for a governor to either overturn a sentence, they can commute a death sentence, or they can completely pardon or expunge your record. For me, I was asking for the governor to use his clemency power to reduce my sentence of 51 years to one of 15 or 25, something that would see me 
able to get a second chance in life. And it sounds simple, like you just file a piece of the paper, but it was an extremely difficult process. Um, clemency is granted to less than 1% of the people who apply for it. Um, very, very, very difficult process to go through. It's very rarely used. Um, it could be used on the federal level by the president for federal prisoners or by governors on the state level. And so for me, I went through the governor to use it. But um, it's a very, very, very important power. It's very unfortunate that it's not used um, enough, nearly enough, because really it's the only remedy within the criminal justice system that can actually take into consideration a person's growth, the rehabilitation that they've exhibited, um, and any extenuating circumstances that played a role in their offense that statute didn't allow to come into play. And that's really important when we're considering treating people as individuals who are going to be released back into the community and trying to help them reintegrate into the community. Yeah, so you mentioned there that <clears throat> it is not as widely used a tool as it could be. So could you talk for a minute about what it did mean to you? You know, what that moment was like when you found out that your clemency petition had been granted? And what do you think it would mean for people in prison who, when they're applying for this relief, had a governor who was out there saying, I will grant this, I want to grant this. What would that, what would that change for people who are currently incarcerated in their families? I mean, this, this is the moment that everyone dreams of. You always dreamed of being told that you're going to get a second chance. From the moment that the court tells you you're going to spend the rest of your life in a prison cell, you long for the day that someone says, no, I'm going to give you a second chance. No, I believe that you can be a better person. I believe that you've done the work um, that it takes to be a successful member of society. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that and to be with your family. And so it was it was life changing. There's there's no better word. It was just life changing. And for those who are still sitting in prison, like they wait for that. They wait for anyone to say, OK, I'm going to give a, a second look to your case. I'm going to give you a second chance, even if it's just a few years off of their sentence. Like that's that's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, I can't even put into words. <laughs> No, I, I completely understand. And, and having heard your story now several times, it, it never ceases to amaze me how deeply inspirational and moving it is. You know, I know you shared your story. Um, I know it's it's in many ways a very recent story, too. You know, this is something that has happened in your life in the recent past. Um, if you could if you could say one thing now to people who are filing petitions, people who are going through this individual clemency process, what would you say to them? And what would you say to the governors who are sitting on this power, seeing these commutation petitions and not acting on them? Well, for anyone who's filing, um, if they happen to be seeing this, I would definitely say, look up the statute for your state, because every state has different statutes, different criteria. Um, that's the first thing that I did. I wanted to know what is it that they, that they look at? What is it that I have that I can show? How can I demonstrate that I meet this criteria? That's really important because most of the applications that are submitted to the parole board are rejected before they can even see the governor for them to be reviewed because they don't meet those basic criteria. So look at look into the statutes, look into that criteria. If you can't figure out the, the legal jargon that are in these statutes, go to the law library, get some help, but really make sure that you have all of your ducks in the row before you send that paperwork in because it just may be the only chance that you have. Um, when it comes to the governor who just lets this paperwork pile up and you figure, well, I'm just going to wait. That's going to be the last thing that I do. You have no idea, no idea what it means for someone to wait just one more day. It's just not that one individual. It's their families. I can't tell you just how many times my heart was broken calling my mom and having to explain to her that, no, I haven't heard anything, calling my husband to tell him I've, I've heard no word. I don't know anything. I don't know when I'm coming home. Like that's, it's an incredible stressor on, on your family. And just think about if it was your child having to wait for that answer. So don't wait till the last minute. Eight years is a very long time. A lot can happen in eight years, especially in prison. Um, so there's no reason why you would have to put off doing something that you could just do today. 
Thank you. You know, so I don't want to, I know there's a, a whole packed show that we want to get to, but I, I do want to ask you one final question, Santoya, before we, before we let you go for a little bit. Um, you know, it, it sounds like part of what you were just saying is that this can no longer be something that just happens for a few people at the end of a governor's term. This has to be something that happens early on in a governor's term for thousands of people. Governors need to step up and say that they're going to do this. I just, if you could, in a few words, tell us sort of, you know, what that could look like for the justice reform movement overall. Obviously, you know, a majority of people who are incarcerated are in state prisons, so we know it would affect millions of people, literally 1.3 million people in state prisons. But from someone, as someone who is a leader in the, in the movement in the fight for decarceration, what would it mean if a governor in the first 100 days of their term says, we're commuting thousands of sentences? I mean, it would mean we're headed on the right track. <laughs> I'll tell you that whenever I got the chance to sit down with Governor Haslam after he granted me clemency, he had said how he hated that he waited so long. He wished that he could have looked at the other 198 juvenile offenders, um, the applications that they would have had. He just didn't have time because it was at the end of his tenure. And so whenever you put things off like that, you don't have the time to really look into each case. You don't really have the time to go to these applications because they're stacking up and stacking up and stacking up. Um, so if it's something that you're consistently doing, you're consistently reviewing these applications and granting it where you see fit, then you can really prevent all that because he did say that that was one of his biggest regrets leaving the office. Amazing. Santoya, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who, who were moved by what Santoya said, uh, join the club and, and hang around because the video we're premiering at the end of this town hall uh, features a lot more uh, of Santoya sharing her story. Um, so moving on, I'm honored now to be joined by two people whose expertise on this issue is remarkably deep and informed by a whole range of experiences, personal and professional. First, Deputy Director for Policy here at the ACLU Justice Division, my colleague, Cynthia Roseberry, who is also the project manager for the 2014 Clemency Project. And we're also joined now by NYU Vice Dean and renowned clemency expert, Professor Rachel Barkow. It is great to be with you. So we'll start off with you, Rachel. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of clemency? It is a longstanding executive power, correct? This is something that there's precedent for, for governors to sort of use this power more widely than they do. Absolutely. You know, it's a cornerstone of our federal government. The framers put it in the Constitution. Um, you know, it's right next to the, the commander in chief powers for the president. Um, that's how important they, they thought it was. And state constitutions uh, typically also vest the governor with really sweeping authority. And I think it's important to note that it's, you know, one of the reasons why it was in these kind of original founding documents is because we've long known that criminal laws are too harsh when they're applied in particular cases. And the framers and other constitutional designers wanted a mechanism that allowed for the correction of unjust sentences, you know, that recognize that sometimes a law is written and it has in mind a very severe kind of a behavior, um, but it ends up getting applied to someone that may fall within its letter, but really doesn't belong within its spirit. Um, and so the sentence is just too long. Uh, and I think they also recognized, as we all know, that people change over time. And so you want to have a mechanism that allows us to take a second look at somebody's sentence um, and give people second chances um, and not just throw them away. You know, so as we think, and, and I hope we all share the view, you know, when people say Black Lives Matter and we think about police abuse, you know, lives matter in, in prisons. And we can't just throw people away and not take a second look at their sentences. And having these clemency provisions and constitutions, state and federal, were designed to do just that and, and had been used actually um, quite frequently, really up until recent decades when it became politicized to, to look like you might be soft on crime in some way. But, um, but they're really a cornerstone of our government and they really need to be revitalized. Yeah, I mean, this is something that this is, there's no inventing the wheel or even reinventing the wheel, right? This is this is utilizing a power that has existed that, as you said, um, could be deployed and should be deployed a lot more forcefully and widely. So, Cynthia, I'd love to turn to you and, and if you could maybe speak a little bit about your experience with the Clemency Project in 2014. And from that experience, 
you know, why do you think it is so important for governors to commit to granting categorical commutations? Why is it so important for governors to say, I will commute the sentences for, for a large group of people? Sure, thanks for that question, Dylan, and thank you for your good work in clemency. Uh, you know, we lead the world in incarceration, and a majority of the folks who are incarcerated in the United States are incarcerated in the state systems. And we got to this point by wholesale locking folks up, right? Just taking groups of people and categories of crimes, mostly black and brown people, and locking them away through more power given to police, given to prosecutors, through um, more stringent sentencing. And so as we see ourselves on top of the world's pyramid of incarcerating people, and with most of those people being in the states, it's incumbent upon the governors to say, I'm going to do something on a large scale because the, the incarceration happened on a large scale. It's incumbent upon them to use broad strokes to give freedom to people. During my experience with Clemency Project 2014, I encountered so many families who were just desperate to have their loved ones come home because they were serving, frankly, draconian sentences. Now we know better. And we should do better. And the governors have the authority to do that. These laws, these criminal laws were written and, and enacted by the stroke of a governor's pen. And with the same stroke of that pen, governors can free thousands of people. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. You know, Rachel, one of the things you talked about there was the idea that, uh, you know, governors should be doing this there there is a need to do it but also you know we have polling that we uh released today as part of the campaign launch showing that there is widespread popular support for this bipartisan majority support governors using commutation powers to release large groups of people to to strengthen communities you know we also know uh from the research of, of experts like you that decarceration actually helps improve public safety right it can strengthen families and communities you know Looking at all the all the facts that we have, all the research we have, looking at the the expertise we have in the field, people from people with lived experience, you know, can you just walk us through, you know, what are the hurdles that exist? Are there hurdles, or should you know, what are the benefits? I guess is a better way to ask the question. You know, what are some of the things that can be gained um, when governors are able to get people out of state prisons and liberate people from prison? You know, I think you just saw an example listening to Centoya. You know, there we have somebody who's giving so much to all of us and her community. Um, and the, you know, the same when we when we hear from Jason Hernandez. There, these are people who have so much to give and bring to their families, their loved ones, their community at large. And it's not doing anybody any good to have people rotting away inside prisons. Um, so there's a big benefit and, and it's a benefit to all of us, I will just add, because most people rejoin their communities at some point anyway. 95% um, of the people who are incarcerated will rejoin their communities. And so it's a question of when. And, and really what commutations using clemency to reduce people's sentences does is allow those sentences to be shortened, um, which we know from the research is good for public safety because the longer people are locked away, the harder it is for them to re-enter. They're not getting good rehabilitative programming inside prisons. Um, they're much better off, you know, rejoining their communities, their loved ones, becoming productive members of society. Um, so it's actually a crime reducer to do it. Um, so really the only hurdle to this um, is, is political. You know, we just haven't had leaders willing to use the power that's been vested in them. Um, and, and I think, you know, frankly, uh, uh, some capital um, and I think what we need are, are leaders to take the bold step and use the power that's been vested in them um, to remedy some really awful injustices and, and to do it in the name of public safety. And, you know, it needs to be massive because the injustices are massive and it, it calls for a commensurate response. Exactly, exactly right. And I think, you know, what you and what you and Cynthia had touched on there, too, is that we need solutions of a magnitude that matches the magnitude of the problem. You know, this is a decades long systemically entrenched problem. The one thing, Rachel, that you talked about earlier, and, and we'll, we'll have this be the final question for, for you and Cynthia. Um, there are, this is a fight for racial justice. You know, the racial disparities in state prison populations and in, in all of the criminal legal system are glaring. 
we know it's a fight for racial justice, but can you just walk us through, you know, why do we have those disparities? You know, where, did, where, where does this come from? How did we get to this point? And how can clemency and categorical clemency be a critical tool in undoing those disparities and inequities and sort of creating a pathway to something better? And I guess, you know, Cynthia, if we want to start with you and then we'll, we'll end on you, Rachel. Sure. So one only has to look at what happens in the criminal legal system in America to understand race, uh, to know that one in every three black boys born today can expect to go to prison because black communities are more often policed. uh, Black people are more often arrested. They're charged with more serious crimes. The sentences are longer and any relief uh, like parole is less often granted. And so when you have that combination of events, you're going to have more black people in prison. Uh, We know that we have to do something about that. John Lewis in his final words said to us that we should answer the highest calling of our hearts and stand up for what we truly believe. And America has long proclaimed that it is a land of second chances and equality. And if that is true, We must act on that. We must see governors say, I will no longer participate in this racially discriminatory practice of locking away Black people as if they are disposable. Yeah. Rachel, do you have any closing thoughts you want to leave us with in terms of what this means and the sort of the movement and the fight for racial justice? Uh, Just, you know, echoing everything that uh, Cynthia just said, it's an enormous burden on communities of color to be policed the way they are, to be prosecuted the way they are, to be sentenced the way they are. And we see racial disparities at every point in that process. And sadly, we've seen racial disparities in the rare grants of clemency that we've had so far. You know, typically the people who get clemency are disproportionately white and well-connected. You know, they know some friend of a friend who knows a person in the state legislature or in Mm. Congress. And it's really time to bring clemency to the overwhelming numbers of regular people who are incarcerated to remedy some of those racial injustices. I I think it's absolutely critical. And one kind of key thing I'll just say is that governors can do this without needing legislative cooperation. So in most states right now, they could do it tomorrow, you know, just with the stroke of their pen. They could remedy so much injustice. They could deal with the outbreak of COVID in their prisons and and do it as a public health measure, as a racial justice measure. They have this authority, and I think they just need to be reminded uh, of how much the public would like to see them use it. So I'm so grateful that this campaign is going to bring attention to what I see as an absolutely crucial power of governors. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel and Cynthia. It is an absolute honor to to be with you tonight and to have your expertise be a part of this campaign. You know, something that uh, Rachel was just talking about there is the fact that governors could do this and they could do it now. And someone who did do this with obviously, you know, the support of, of folks like um, Cynthia, who we just heard from, too, was President Barack Obama, who granted commutation to hundreds of people. One of those people is an author and an activist, someone whose grant of clemency from the president tells a powerful story of, of hope, of opportunity, of redemption, Jason Hernandez has been on the front lines of this fight for a long time, uh, and we are honored, so honored to have him with us tonight. Jason, thank you so much for being here. Um, You know, you've spoken in the past, Jason, about how hard you had to work and how fortunate you were to receive a commutation from President Obama. I know you you shared your story in, in multiple venues before, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself, about the process of applying for the commutation Um, And what that process was like, what it was like to have to go through that kind of from where you were at the time. Uh, Well, first, it's it's an honor to be here. I've always dreamed of this mass clemency to end mass incarceration campaign, something that I had uh, just envisioned since prison. And for now, 10 years from that date when I thought about it for it to actually be happening and for me to be a part of it is just such an honor uh, to hopefully help people receive what I was fortunate to receive uh, but, you know, a little bit about me in 1998, I was sentenced to life without parole plus 320 years for a nonviolent drug offense. Uh, the judge, he advised me when he sentenced me that he didn't want to give me life without parole, but that he had no choice. And, you know, when I went to prison, I started doing the law. I became what was known as a jailhouse attorney. And after my 
all my appeals were basically done uh, 12 years into my sentence. I started to look at clemency and clemency is just a word at that time, which was not even mentioned in prison because we had always seen it not as a, uh, not as something that people received that deserved it, but people who received that knew somebody that knew the president or that knew the government, that knew the governor, uh, people like me, black and brown people just was something that, uh, uh, was not something that was not a reality for us. Uh, but despite that fact, there was a person who was in, uh, who was president at that time named uh, President Barack Obama. And I had just felt if there was some way, somehow, uh, that I could get him to understand about who I was, not my case, but who I was as, as a person, that I had no doubt that he would let me out. But here I am, I'm a prisoner. I don't know anybody that knows President Obama. So that was the million dollar question. How do I make the president aware that I exist. And I just, how would you say I threw the kitchen sink at it? I ended up creating my own organization while I was in prison called Crack Open the Door, advocating for nonviolent drug, uh, crack cocaine offenders serving life without parole. I started to put, uh, put my own petitions together. Uh, I wrote op-eds, I changed, I would draft legislation, how it should be, how it should be, you know, how it should be changed to release us. And I wrote senators, House of Representatives, civil rights organizations, criminal justice organizations, editors, uh, newspapers, uh, even people that were that were famous, like actors, to, to try to get my voice heard. Uh, my brother created a website for me. Uh, my mother and father, uh, even my mother and father, in their in their in their sixties, I would ha they would go out to the community and talk to the school teachers that knew me that would write the support letters. They, would, they knew people that, that were part of this. There were city officials who wrote letters on my behalf. And but I think the most important thing that I did was I put my own clemency petition together and sent it. And then I penned a letter to President Barack Obama explaining to him that I was sorry for what I did. And I deserve to be in prison and I deserve to be punished. But I didn't deserve to die in there. And to just give me a second chance and to let me go back to my community and make right what I had done wrong. And fortunately, uh, 22, no, no, uh, 26 months later, after I wrote him, he wrote me back and reduced my life sentence to 20 years. And fortunately, I'm here talking to you right now as a result of that. I have not met him as Centoya met the governor that released her. I'm kind of upset with him about that. But uh, I believe one of these days, uh, he's going to give me a call and, and invite me to come uh, have dinner with him one of these days. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. If, if President Obama is watching, this is the moment we need you. We need you to come on down and, and uh, chat with Jason a little bit and, and talk more about about that experience. You know, just one thing that you talked about uh, so eloquently there and in sharing your story before. And I should say, too, that um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to check out the new website for this campaign, ACLU.org slash clemency, uh, please do. And also please check out Jason's blog, which is now live on that website. Um, and we'll be promoting that all across the ACLU social media platforms in the weeks ahead as well. Um, but an incredibly powerful story. But, you know, it felt like there was probably several moments in that, Jason, where it felt like you didn't have a shot at this. You know, it felt like um, you were working hard. You, you had a lot of connections. You had more resources probably than a lot of other people do, um, even with the limited resources you had. From that perspective, could you talk to us a little bit about what that what that moment meant, what that moment of redemption meant, um, what that would mean for other people. And also, you know, I know you said you'd envision this campaign for a long time. Where does that envisioning come from? How is that envisioning informed by your experience and by the experience that you uh, by what you had to endure to, in order to receive your commutation? Yeah, you know, what, what did redemption mean for me? Uh, it meant that I wasn't, I wasn't going to die in prison. Uh, and then for me to be released, uh, and then there were so many, you know, so many amazing people that were in there that I thought that were, that were more, uh, more, more deserving of clemency than myself, but they just didn't believe that it could happen. And, you know, to leave them behind, it, it was hard. It was, it was difficult. But, you know, but redemption in the form of receiving clemency also meant to me that I had paid my debt to, to society for what I had did. And I had also been forgiven for what I did. 
And that forgiveness part is a huge distinction from the person who is released, say, from after they just complete their sentence in a regular circumstance. And this is because when one is given clemency, something so extraordinary, it shifts any thought process one might have that society owes you into I owe society. I owe society now. I owe that person, the president of the United States who showed me mercy, or, or whether it's a governor, I owe my community, I owe those in prison that I was incarcerated with to not only go out and do good, uh, but to go above and beyond and to be that example, to be that face of what a second chance can look like. You know, I made a promise to the president that I would come out and I would make a change and I would make a difference. I would like to think that I'm, I'm living up to that. I still have further to go. And the other thing, too, as well, I would say that, you know, my behavior is just not reflective of me. Uh, there's numerous individuals that I stay in contact with that President Barack Obama let out dozens and dozens of individuals, and they're all still out. They're all doing amazing things for themselves, for their family, and for their community. And not a single one of them, uh, you know, has went back. You know, when an individual receives clemency, there is a responsibility, a duty, an extreme gratitude for your freedom, for being given a second chance, for being given your life back like I was and so many other individuals that President Barack Obama granted clemency to. So it's about just not only making right what was wrong at one time, mm -hmm. but that individual going out and being that light, showing what a second chance can look like. Yeah, Jason, we'll, uh, we'll end on this question. And it's a question that I also asked to Santoya, given the experience she went through with the governor in her state. What does it mean? I mean, I know in your case, it was a president, but, but what does it mean? What would it mean if a governor, one office, or while they're in office said, I am going to grant commutations for thousands of people. I want those commutations on my desk. I want whatever process has to happen to happen, but I'm going to grant categorical commutations to thousands of people. What does that mean for people who are incarcerated? What does it mean for this movement? That, that is a really good question because when we think about clemency, we think about you know what it means to the person that's receiving it, right? We think about the person who is going to be reunited with, with their family and the impact uh, that that will have on that specific family and their community when he or she returns. But there's a flip side to that coin. You know, we hardly think about what does it mean for the you know, for the governor uh, who gives mercy and who shows mercy and forgiveness through clemency. And we have talked about redemption. And I think in this instance, uh, redemption is just not for the individuals that are incarcerated. Uh, that, in, that redemption uh, applies to the, not only the receiver, but that one who is given it as well. I, I call it what I feel a double-edged redemption. And what I mean by that is by giving second chances through clemency, Governors can redeem themselves and their states for passing these laws that sent mothers and fathers and then ultimately their children to prison uh, for decades and even some for the rest of their lives, like I was sentenced to. Uh, laws that were founded on ideas and beliefs uh, that were not supported by any type of research or reasonable judgment. Uh, but now, through clemency, the states can say, we acknowledge that we did what, what we did was wrong and that we're sorry uh, and we want to make up for that tragic mistake and try to make right what we have done wrong. And though there is much, much that they must do to correct uh, these misguided and admittedly un unintentional mistakes, clemency is the way to start that process, uh, this process of healing and redemption, but ultimately reconciliation as well. Yeah, I, I mean, it's so incredibly powerful just to hear you talk about your experience, Jason. Um, it is an honor to be with you tonight. And spoiler alert for everyone watching, it will be an honor to have Jason be a part of this campaign for months and years. Um, thank you, Jason. Looking forward to working with you on this. Thank you. Thank you. You know, one thing Jason talked about there is the need for, for systemic reform and also the impact that reform will have on the system actors who drive that reform. Someone who has been a leading figure in that, uh, is our next and final guest of the evening, San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Boudin. When DA Boudin won his race for DA, it sent absolute shockwaves through the justice reform movement. It reaffirmed that people are looking for a new kind of prosecutor with a new vision 
And DA Boudin's commitment to systemic reform is absolutely remarkable. So DA Boudin, we are so honored to have you here tonight. I know there's so much happening uh, every day and it's just for you to take some time out to chat with us. It, it means so much to me, to the ACLU family uh, and to everyone who's watching this. So thank you for being here. You know, we'll start thank off by just, of course, you know, we'll start off by just by talking a little bit about kind of what's happening now in San Francisco. I mean, your background obviously informs your leadership in your vision as a prosecutor. And we're in the midst too now of a remarkable time with the pandemic that's happening across the country. You've responded to that pandemic by taking some dramatic actions to reduce jail populations in San Francisco. How are you able to accomplish that? What lessons can we draw from that? How has your experience sort of shaped your vision in these moments? Well, thank you for the generous introduction, Dylan. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, I actually spent one of my law school summers working for the ACLU. So uh, fond memories of that time and the amazing people I worked with. You know, one of the things that sets me apart from many other prosecutors, especially elected district attorneys, is that I know personally the impact of incarceration. I have spent my entire life visiting my parents in prison from the time I was an infant. And I also worked at the start of my legal career as a public defender here in San Francisco. Another thing that sets me apart from most elected district attorneys, I've represented hundreds, if not thousands, of incarcerated people. I bring a different perspective because I understand the human cost of incarceration, because I understand that there are alternatives that actually are more effective from a public safety standpoint. And in this moment, I know personally the fear of losing an incarcerated loved one to COVID. I spoke with my father on a phone call from his prison earlier today. The fact that he's been incarcerated in fear, people in his prison have died, is something that is uh, absolutely tangible to me in a way that I think it's simply not for most, uh, for most prosecutors. It's very easy as a district attorney to dehumanize and otherize people you prosecute and people you send to prison. I can't and I won't do that. So in the context of COVID, when San Francisco public health officials said that we needed to reduce the jail population dramatically because of the pandemic, I listened and I followed their, uh, their demands. We reduced the number of people in San Francisco County Jail from January when I took office till today by uh, nearly 40%. And we did most of that in the March and April period. We did it through a number of different uh, concerted efforts. We released some people early um, who had a sentence to serve in county jail. We made probation office offers to expedite settlement of cases. We identified people who were elderly or medically vulnerable and found ways to get them released with appropriate supervision. And we also identified some people in the process who really never should have been incarcerated in the first place, certainly uh, even without regard to COVID. We found a woman, for example, with no criminal record, serving time on a misdemeanor who had a high-risk pregnancy. We want someone like that in a residential prenatal care facility where she and the baby can get the support and medical treatment they need, not in a dangerous county jail. Um, it has forced us to take a hard look at who we incarcerate and why we are so quick to incarcerate. And I think one of the things we've learned, and I hope we get to talk about that some more, is that we can, in fact, dramatically reduce the number of people in our jails and prisons, and we can do it quickly, and we can do it safely. That's one of the lessons that we've learned here in San Francisco. Crime rates have fallen uh, by historic levels, even as we are dramatically reducing our reliance on jails. I think it's a lesson for the country. Uh, we need uh, elected officials in uh, district attorney's offices and in governor's offices across the country to rethink who, why, and for how long we incarcerate. Yeah, and, and one thing you alluded to there, uh, Chesa, was this idea that you know, you're having to respond in a moment of crisis, right? You're having to respond in a moment of a global pandemic to systemic injustices, to systemic problems. And I think, as you just said, it reaffirms the need for actual longstanding policy reform, policy change. And you're someone who is a leader in the movement for justice reform. You are someone who is driving policy change from your office. In that work, 
Could you just tell us the difference between case by case decision making versus actually broad and bold policy proposals? You know, why is it so important to have those broad proposals, those those large scale proposals um, as, as part of the effort of, of in the justice reform fight? It's absolutely essential to think big picture and broad. And the reason for that is that the scale of mass incarceration is so dramatic, is so unprecedented, is so out of touch with what you see in any other country in the history of the world. This is not a problem that can be solved one case at a time. Even in an office like mine that just deals with cases from a single county, San Francisco County, we could spend all of our time chasing individual cases, trying to right past wrongs, trying to prevent wrongs from occurring in the cases that are currently pending. And literally, that's all we would do in cases would still fall through the cracks. It'd be a bit like the catcher in the rye. You would never catch every case. You would never avoid or undo all of the historic wrongs. Um, and some folks, some souls would fall through the cracks. Instead, we need to think broad. We need to think about systemic change, we need to think about policy change. I'll give you an example of an area where we've done this, um, and it's money bail. It's an issue that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but for those who aren't, let me just briefly explain how the money bail system works, why it's such a cancer at the heart of the criminal justice system in this country, and how systemic policy change is the only way to address it. Money bail is a system, in, in very brief overview terms, where someone who is arrested can immediately buy their way out of custody, no matter how serious the charge is, no matter how um, many prior convictions they have, no matter how strong the evidence against them. Well, another person arrested for low level charges with no criminal history, who presents no public safety risk, would be stuck in jail simply because they don't have enough money to buy their way out. It's a system that actually undermines public safety by allowing wealthy people who are dangerous to buy their freedom and a system that undermines equal protection of law by depriving people of liberty simply based on their poverty. And yet it's the system that most jurisdictions, including San Francisco, have relied on in this country for decades. When I took office, instead of saying, well, we're going to look at this case by case and decide whether to ask for bail or how much bail to ask for, we solve the problem systemically by saying none of our assistant district attorneys will ever be allowed to ask a judge to put a price tag on freedom. Instead, if we think someone is so dangerous that they shouldn't be released, we'll ask the court to detain them without regard to their wealth. And if we think that someone is safe to be released, then we'll ask the court to release them on whatever conditions are appropriate rather than tying it to their ability to make a monetary payment. Now, I could give you many other examples like this, Dylan, um, where systemic reforms, rather than individual case decision making, is the only way to really uh, effectuate system change. If we have time, I'll give you one more example. Let's, let's hop me. back. Go ahead. No, please, go ahead. Well, just very briefly, we know that driving well black or brown is a serious problem uh, in this country. We know that racial profiling and discriminatory police tactics uh, dramatically impact quality of life for black and brown Americans across the country. And in San Francisco, we have decades worth of data showing that San Francisco police department are far more likely to stop and search and then arrest black or brown drivers. Um, and despite years of efforts to change that practice, to change the behavior of San Francisco police, to ensure equal enforcement of the law, we haven't seen the numbers change. So we made a decision, rather than treating it case by case, that as a matter of policy, my office will decline to charge cases that stem from stop and frisk style, pretextual stopping uh, of motorists. It's a way that we can truly incentivize police to change their behavior to stop systematic civil rights violations and racial profiling. It's not something we could ever do uh, if we simply treated it case by case. We've sent a loud and clear message to the police that we will not be complicit in racial profiling, stop and frisk style tactics, or um, the, the sort of uh, dragnets that have done so much damage to public trust 
in law enforcement uh, across the country. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely I mean, I'm new to doing this work. <laughs> you know, I think the, the work is always <laughs> as necessary and urgent, um, but certainly more now, more so than ever. So we just have one more minute, but I want to just conclude with this question um, and I'd love to get your quick thoughts on this. You know, what you've talked about there is the fact that case by case decisions, like you said, are not the way to do systemic reform. You know, we look to governors, for example, and what Santoya talked about a few minutes ago. This can't be a case by case decision making process with clemency and commutations. Governors need to say, we're going to do this categorically. We're going to do this systematically. And you are someone who, even as one of the most progressive and fearless prosecutors in the country, you can only do so much, you know, and a lot of what you were talking about, too, is sort of on the front end of the system, the arrests, the bails, the pretrials. From your perspective, um, just to end quickly on this note, from your perspective, what role should governors play in this in this fight? Um, and, you know, even with the limits on your power being what they are, kind of what would you like to see governors do to kind of help you, right, to help you get people out of jails and prisons and, and to decarcerate the country? Absolutely. You know, we're in a situation where it's clearer than ever that mass incarceration is a serious ongoing threat to public safety. And we know that because you don't need to look any further than San Quentin State Prison. We've had 22 people die from COVID because the Department of Corrections transferred people who they should have known were positive COVID carriers into a population that up until that point didn't have any cases. Over half of the prison's population in San Quentin uh, ultimately tested positive. Governors have more power than anyone else when it comes to systemic reform of state prisons and release of people in state prisons. Look, California state prison has over 100,000 people incarcerated today, just today. And that is actually a significant decrease from what it was 10 or 15 years ago. But according to the Department of Corrections own data, over half of those people uh, in the neighborhood of 50,000 people are low risk if they're released. The governor has the power to say people who are low risk, you can define the categories however you want, broad systemic approach, people who are low risk, people who are over the age of 55, people who have served more than 10 years of their prison sentence can all be released immediately or as soon as a reentry plan is developed. That's the difference between governors and DAs. The only power that I have when it comes to people in our state prison system is case by case with regard to people in state prison from California, excuse me, from San Francisco County. I do not have the power to do anything with regard to inmates from other counties, and I don't have the power to do broad systemic change when it comes to releases from state prison. But governors across the country in every single one of the 50 states have the power to save lives, to be bold, to be forward looking, to help us as a country move away from our addiction to mass incarceration and move towards redemption and policies that actually uh, allow for healing and for hope. I'm hoping that governors will take advantage of this opportunity in this moment and do the right thing to help all of us move forward as a country. D.A. Boudin, such an honor to have you here tonight. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for being a leader in this work and uh, everything he said. Uh, this is an opportunity and a moment for governors to really act and to lead. Um, and we are so honored to have you here tonight. So thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great to be with you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as promised at the start of tonight, we are now going to premiere a film directed by my colleague, Louis Conway. Um, this is a powerful short documentary on the power of clemency and the way that clemency can be used to correct longstanding systemic injustices. Earlier tonight, uh, we shared the trailer for this video, but now we're even more pleased to share the full length film. For the next 12 minutes, please sit back and enjoy our film, Corrective Compassion. I would describe clemency, if I can only use one word, as redemption. It's an opportunity where the executive recognizes that a person has changed and, and really, through executive action, redeems that person out of a life inside a prison into a new life where they can be with their family and they can work and do what we want rehabilitated people to do. So 
my name is Centoya Brown Long. I am 32 years old, and at the age of 16, I was actually told that I'd spend the rest of my life in prison. I was convicted in Tennessee of killing a man that had picked me up for sex, and I was sentenced to 51 years before I ever would receive the possibility of being released. You know, whenever I was sentenced, it felt like I was being told that my life didn't matter, that my life was over, there was nothing left to salvage. I think if, if people have heard of me, it's by virtue of my relationship to the Centoya Brown case. Uh, my connection to her case was I was working as a prosecutor in the Tennessee Attorney General's office when she submitted her appeal. And it was assigned to me. I was the prosecutor who argued um, in the appellate courts of Tennessee that her conviction was proper, that she was properly tried as an adult, and that she was properly sentenced to 51 years in prison. My name is Jason Hernandez. In 1998, I was indicted uh, for conspiracy to distribute uh, controlled substances, and I was sentenced to life without parole plus 320 years. Uh, 2013, President Barack Obama granted me clemency, whereby he reduced my life without parole sentence to 20 years. Our prison system right now is based on punishment. It should be based on redemption, acknowledging one has done wrong and why they've done wrong, and reintegrating that person back into society. You know, once, once the conviction is, is imposed and the sentence is handed down, Prosecutors tend to move on to the next case. They don't have the luxury of coming back 20 years later and finding out, well, what, what happened to that person? How are they doing now? Once I started seeing the kind of changes that people can make and making friends with those people, I started seeing justice in a more holistic way. Um, whenever you see someone who has been in and out of the system, if you ask me, the question isn't, you know, why do they keep messing up? It's what could we be doing to help this individual more? You know, people can't just be thrown away, and it's not wise to just, just throw people away. Um, we're capable of growing and becoming better people. I think that, that really what's more going with the grain and in line with our best values is accountability that always is seeking to restore that person who has committed the harm, to help them learn, to help them grow, experience transformation, and ultimately move you know, beyond that and live a better life. And that's really, I think, the only way that they can atone for what they have done. Because, you know, thinking that, you know, that more harm, if we just harm another person, that that all of a sudden makes the first harm right or compensates somebody, you know, again, it, it, in theory, maybe, but that's just not reality. You know, we're more complex than that. Um, it, the, 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 the roots of crime are, are more complex than that. Well, your, your environment is everything. I'd like to believe that if I was born not on the east side of my neighborhood, but on the west side of my neighborhood, uh, that I probably would have been an officer, uh, that I probably would have been involved in politics. But when you look at mass incarceration and the war on drugs and tough, get tough uh, policies, minorities have suffered the brunt of that, uh, that we make up nearly two thirds of the prison, the prison population, and in some southern states that minorities make up over two-thirds of the prison population. Fathers are in prison, the children grow up following their path. That leaves one person in that neighborhood. Those are the mothers. There are countless women who share, you know, the same stories, similar stories as mine. Many of the women that I knew, um, a lot of them were involved in abusive situations, um, reacted out of that abusive situation. You know, these were people's mothers, and they were having to mother from there inside the prison, over the prison phone. So it really, um, it affects far more than just that one individual. And that you have this collateral impact, these consequences uh, that not only affect that family, but they break down the entire community. Because then you have these big clusters of, of majority who are black or brown people where they just can't rebound, where they don't have that support system, where they can't go to their, uh, to their brother or to their sister because they're in prison. Uh, 
Um, people are kind of figuring out that the war on drugs was wrong-headed from its genesis and that it was pre predominantly waged in poor communities, you know, of, of, you know, black and brown people. So it's certainly more palatable to talk about nonviolent drug offenders. Um, that's the low-hanging fruit. Um, but, but folks who've committed violent crimes, you know, I don't think that when you talk about criminal justice reform that you can exclude them from the equation. Many times when you get involved in a situation and you react violently, it's not that that's just your first response. It's sometimes people have just been pushed to that point. Here is this one victim that we all know about, but this other individual has circumstances as well. And it looks like they've been a victim of some things that led them to this, this path of action. We have this myth that retribution is somehow the key to an experience of justice. And I think that that is a false myth. There's not some magic number of years that if they sit in a prison cell will atone for the harm that they've caused to their victim or their victim's family. I started thinking, well, justice is not a zero-sum game where I can only care about one person, you know, and if I care about rehabilitation, that somehow diminishes my concern for the rights of victims. It's not that way at all. I, I cultivated an understanding that, you know, even though some of them had committed really, really bad, violent crimes, they had not forfeited their humanity, that there was still so much good and, and potential there to be worked with, you know, and nurtured and cultivated. Even though they may have committed crimes that we have more of a visceral reaction to, even though we might be more scared of them, um, and they might be serving longer sentences, we also know that folks age out of even violent crime. So you could create, you could make, you could commit a crime when you're 20, and then be in prison for that same crime at the age of 40 or 50, 60, and there is no mechanism that accounts for that. We know that a lot of individuals are serving these excessive sentences. And I think that all those sentences that are not uh, proportionate to the crime should be evaluated. They show that they have not, they're not gonna be a threat to society and that their sentence is, is, is uh, out of proportion for, for, for what their crime, and that they should receive clemency. Of course, the president has the authority to release people that are convicted of federal crimes, but mass incarceration is, is a product of what's going on in our states. But the only people that can release these individuals that are in state prison is the governor. The judicial process doesn't always allow for compassion. It doesn't always allow for someone to see, okay, I see you as a person. I understand there's some more things we can do. Sometimes statute binds them. Uh, I think that true justice, justice that's, that's not just retribution, but real justice, um, it, it is like an umbrella, and compassion is part of that. You know, we need to understand uh, a person's history, uh, the potential that the person has um, to overcome those bad moments. Um, we need to regard those people with compassion. Someone may have made a mistake. They have, may have committed a crime when you know they were not themselves when they were overcome with emotion or different circumstances but they've grown from that and you know they've strove to be better they've they've bettered themselves they've really sought forgiveness and here they are asking for another opportunity to be a productive member of society uh, I think that we're real, really kind of in a crisis where we have got so many people locked up doing such long sentences that it's almost like releasing a pressure valve, you know, that there are certain people that we know have aged out uh, or they are primary caregivers um, and, and, you know, people who have great institutional records 30 years long that we know if we give them a chance that the likelihood that they're going to reoffend is next to nothing. Um, so it makes sense for the governors to use their clemency power in those cases. The country recognizes that, that criminal justice reform is needed, that it is coming, um, and that in situations where you know you have good articulable reasons for granting clemency, I don't think governors are, are going to experience a blowback from that. I would just say you've you've got to be bold. You've got to be that leader that does what's right. And it may not always be political, but it's the right thing to do. That's what we need in our country. Um, that's what we need in our state. That's what we need in our leaders.
You know, the one thing about clemency, uh, based on statistics, what it shows is that an individual that, reser- that, that receives clemency is less likely to reoffend. Because I think that it, it is, you have somebody, whether it's the governor or whether it's the president, telling you that I, you know, I kind of, I, I forgive you. We could sit here and say all the legal terms of what clemency is, but it's about forgiveness about compassion, uh, about giving somebody a second chance, and uh, realizing that everybody's redeemable, regardless of their color, race, uh, religion, gender, that everybody deserves a second chance. Thank you uh, to Lewis, my colleague, to Jason Santoya, for, to Preston for being in that video. Uh, I've seen that a few times now, and it is uh, is moving as it was the very first time I saw it. So I hope everyone enjoyed that. Uh, and uh, if you check out, again, the new website for our campaign, aclu.org slash clemency, uh, that video, along with the trailer you saw earlier, are up there. So please go ahead, watch, share, um, share on your network, share with your friends. Um, before we leave, I'll bring back up now uh, Jason and Centoya, who uh, we heard from earlier, who we saw in that video. We only have a minute left. I know we're already a little bit over time, but just in a few quick words, um, and Centoya, we'll start with you and then go over to you, Jason. What can people do to, to help this effort? How can people get involved in the fight for mass clemency across the country? That's a good question. Um, you can get involved. You can go to the ACLU's website. I know you guys have put up Um, a call to action, letting everyone know what they can do. Each state has their own um, branch of the ACLU that you can hook up with and and see what campaigns you can do in your own state, whether your state has school zone drug laws where people are facing excessive sentences. Um, You can team up with them to come up with a campaign um, to advocate for mass clemency for those individuals. But the point is, like, see what you can do. Reach out to these different groups, reach out to the governor, start tweeting, start calling, letting them know that you want them to use their power of clemency to give individuals a second chance. Yeah, I second all of that. This is something where governors need to hear from their constituents. So Jason, we'll end on you. What can people do? How can people get involved in the fight for mass clemency? How can they support the redemption campaign? Well, first, if if, if they are down and they can have any impact I would like for them to think about me and where I was 10 years ago today. Life without parole, 320 years, eight by six prison cell. And from there, a prisoner, me, I was able to get the president to not only listen to me, but to convince him to set me free. And if I can do that in those circumstances, imagine what you can do with your being free. If 2020 has shown us anything, is that this is the year of the advocate and that everything starts at a grassroots level. This clemency campaign is the first of its kind. It's going to be huge on ended mass incarceration, but we can't do it by ourselves. We're gonna need your help. Go to the ACLU's website, uh, aclu.org slash clemency. And as, t- as Tony Morrison said, if you are free, you need to help free somebody else. We're counting on you, those that are in prison, the families that have loved ones in prison. Let's make this happen. Let's reach out to those governors. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Santoya. And we will wrap it there to everyone who is watching tonight. Thank you so much to all of our panelists, Rachel Barkow, Cynthia Roseberry, D.A. Chase Boudin, and of course, Jason Hernandez and Santoya Brown. Thank you so much for being a part of this, for lending your voice, your expertise, your vision to this work. This is just the beginning. The campaign is launched. We are live. We are ready to go. We are eager to get to work in states across the country, partnering with ACLU affiliates every step of the way. 
and we cannot wait to bring more information to you all and the public. We look forward to seeing you out there. We look forward to having you be a part of this campaign. But in the meantime, aclu.org slash clemency, check it out, check out the call to action, add your name. And together we will, in the next five years, liberate 50,000 people from state prisons through the use of categorical computations. We can get this done. Thank you all for watching. It has been an absolute honor to share this work with you tonight.